Right. Well, we just had one that went public uh, digitally the 21st of uh, whatever last month was, oh, July. Well, what is it about? It's, it's the Grand Unified Theory of Howard Bloom. It's a 66-minute documentary. It won uh, the Best uh, Film Award, Best Picture Award at the Science Design Film Festival in California. Wow, it's, very uh, cool. So it's been at Doc NYC at the Santa Barbara International um, Film Festival, and it's got uh, Raw Science, the Raw Science Film Festival coming up, and the Not Science Film Festival in Italy. So, very nice, and eventually, hopefully, I guess, be on VOD so everyone can see it worldwide. Or well, it's uh, it's on Amazon. It's on okay, uh, it's on yeah, it's on everything but Netflix. Gotcha. Like, most people got Amazon Prime now anyway, so it's all good. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I rely on it completely. Oh, exactly, yeah. exactly. So uh, I'm very excited to talk to you because I am a huge uh, music and history buff, and you've had a big part in a lot of amazing music careers over the years as a publicist. So I would love if I could just name off some artists you work with, or you could tell us some interesting story. Maybe might have been like a challenge you had promoting them because like they're all legends now, but I'm sure at the time getting it, getting the word out there must have been some challenge or something, you know? Well, some of them were unknowns. Yeah. So I yeah, got to start with Kiss, a band that I love to death, you know? Okay, now Kiss. Okay, Stephen. Kiss was a band on which I felt I utterly failed. Kiss had made oh, really? a strange decision. Yes. It wanted to take off the makeup and it wanted to be respected as uh as musicians uh -huh. um you know for its chops um and uh we worked hard to make that happen and it, but but without well kiss is a modestly good band um musically and they've yeah, had some i'll admit that <laughs> yes they've had some <laughs> terrific is what they're known for you know? <laughs> right plus um gene Stan, gene simmons is the overwhelming personality in the band Oh, yeah. um, he is a human three times the size of a normal life-size human. Um, I've got to interview him a couple of times. He's, uh, he's playful, playful, great. <laughs> right, so he's a force. And Paul Stanley is responsible for the music. So the real deal here was to publicize Paul Stanley. But I never got to sit down and do, you know, I developed a technique called secular shamanism. And it was about getting at the gods inside of you that make your music for you. And I hadn't quite developed that technique yet when KISS hired me. So in theory, I was the perfect publicist to gotcha. promote their musical chops. But in reality, I did, you know, we got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories for them. Um, yeah. We had a, a basic principle. If, if you were with a normal PR firm and they got you six major stories a month, they were very pleased with themselves. If my publicist, failed to deliver, in other words, delivered less than six, 60 stories a month. Um, in fact, if she failed to deliver 120 stories a month, I was radically unsatisfied. And I was radically unsatisfied because people don't register something from just seeing one story once in their lifetime. They register something on the 15th viewing. On the 16th viewing, all of a sudden, they think they see it for the first time. In reality, the previous 15 have been doing what psychologists call queuing, you know, building up a, a, a ground base, a foundation um, in their minds that finally reaches consciousness. So if I can't reach you 15 times um, with one of my artists or what Kiss trying to demonstrate their musical ability and take the make off off, then I haven't reached you at all. So we did that. We got a huge multiplicity of stories, but without having a powerful Gene Simmons story to tell about the origins of his music, we didn't have the stuff, the substance to go on. And that was my fault because I had not yet learned, I had not yet learned to absolutely insist that I get to spend a day with you. If you were Gene, if you were Paul Stanley, I needed to get to spend a day with you in your own environment after studying you for a minimum of six weeks after reading every interview you'd ever done, every lyric you'd ever written, every album cover you'd ever put out, everything you'd ever done. And then my job was this. If you came to me and you wanted to be one of my clients, I said, look, if you expect me to create an artificial mask for you, uh, let's call it an image, and sit back like a guy in a plaid flannel suit with a cigar in his hand and say, kid, I'm gonna make you a star with this artificial mask, then I'm gonna send you to my best competitor, Rogers and Cowan, I'll have you in their office in two hours. 
Um, if you're going to work with me, you have to understand that music is not about an exchange of pieces of plastic. It is not about an exchange of dollar bills. It is about an exchange of soul. And here's that. what I mean. Yeah, well, here's what I mean. You sit down at two o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon. You've got a, a album deadline. You've got to write a lyric. You know you cannot possibly write a lyric. You have no idea of how you've ever written a lyric in your life. But by four in the afternoon, there's a lyric in front of you. My job is to find the gods inside of you that wrote that lyric. Um, you go on stage, and on a really good night, you see the, the eyes widening, the pupils dilating of your audience. You see their faces melting. You see their collective energy melting into one big blob like an amoeba and reach something like a pseudopod out to you. And all of the energy of that 700 or 70,000 people flows through you as if you were an empty pipe. You have an out-of-body experience. You watch the whole thing from the ceiling. You are danced like a marionette by that flow of energy from the audience that you then transmogrify somewhere around here and turn into some weird deed that flows back through you and makes their audiences, their pupils and their eyes widen even further. And then again, their energy flows through you. You were a puppet, a marionette being danced by something bigger than yourself, by the souls of 70,000 people and by what Peter Townsend used to call the Godhead. Um, yeah. within you for 70 minutes. My job is to find the gods inside of you that entranced that audience and that took you over for that 70 minutes. So if I could have done that with Paul Stanley, um, maybe we could have made some progress, but I was not smart enough. It took me years to evolve this technique and I hadn't quite evolved it when I got Gene and Paul. Well, I actually want to go before your career because um, here at Bonic Buzz, we're all about people's passion. Where did your passion for music came from growing up in Buffalo? Because you're also very passionate about science and psychiatry and stuff. I feel like that goes a lot in the hand to hand in promoting music. It, it, it does because my fat, I started in science and theoretical physics and microbiology at the age of 10. By the age of 12, I had uh, gotten my first scientific chops. Um, I had co-designed co a computer that won several science fair awards. Uh, I had built my first Boolean algebra machine. I've been schlepped off for a meeting with the head of the graduate physics department at the University of Buffalo. And we had discussed Big Bang versus steady state theory of the universe and the interpretation of the Doppler shift for an hour. And he'd come out of his office and put his hand on my shoulder and said to my mom, you don't have to say for grad school for him. He'll get uh, fellowships in theoretical physics at any school he wants. So, and, and uh, my mom had set me up for private tutoring sessions with the head of research and development for Moog Valve, which was the company that made the valves for the jets and rockets for the first plane to break the sound barrier and for the first plane to go to the edge of space wow. with humans in it. So, um, but at the age of 13, uh, I had my bar mitzvah, I took the money and I bought a record player. And I love classical music, Rachmaninoff, Beethoven, Bartok, Stravinsky, all of that stuff. And I could not live without listening to music. I read two books a day. I read one under the desk at school and another one when I got home. And I put on, in those days, you had an automatic spindle and the records were big platters. And you could put six of those platters on the automatic spindle and just have three hours of music running straight. And then you'd turn the stack upside down and it'll play the other side of those six records. And then when I went to bed, I put another stack on and it played those records for the first three hours when I was sleeping. Oh. So music was like a, a, a second by second necessity um, when I wasn't at school. Well, who knows? You know, mysteries, music is one of those huge mysteries. We don't know why it appeals to us. We don't know what it does for us. And, and at, the age, at the age of 13, I realized I was an atheist. My parents tried to drag me off to high holiday ser services and, you know, the most important Jewish holidays of the year. And they got me all the way to Richmond Avenue where, where the temple was. And then um, they tried to get me out of their blue four-door Fraser and I wouldn't budge. So there was, I had a scene where my parents were dragging at my ankles, trying to pull me out of the car. And I was holding on to the door frame of the sturdily made blue Fraser four-door. And, um, and I had Classic a sudden realization, yeah. <laughs> right? But I, I had this realization. Yeah. Galileo, one of my heroes, had done what he'd done by taking a device designed for horizontal viewing. It was a tube with a lens at each end. 
and it was designed to allow you to see the troops of the Spanish coming over the horizon. If you were in Holland, it was a Dutch military um, device, yeah. high tech. And, and he did something radically unexpected. He turned that tube up to the sky, which Steve was ridiculous. It was absurd. Everybody knew what was up there. First of all, it was God's underwear. It was very impolite to peek, or it was the <laughs> bottom of God's living room rug. Um, secondly, Aristotle said that, uh, that the, cir the, the circle and sphere were the perfect shapes. And since God is perfection, it had to be all circles and spheres up there. And what Galileo saw was lumpy stones. Lumpy stones, <laughs> not perfect shapes at all. And he changed the way, he changed the relationship of humankind to the universe. Um, and a guy named Anton von Leeuwenhoek invented the microscope. And he took a, a lens that he used to look at fabrics that he was importing to see how fine the weave was. And he turned it in an unexpected direction, down at pond water. And he saw what he called animalcules, a whole world of animals we had never known existed before. So I suddenly realized, okay, I'm an atheist. There are no gods in the heavens above. There are no gods beneath the earth. But are there gods in these scenes? Yes, where are they? They're in my parents. They're in that incredible passion with which they're willing to drag their firstborn son like a sack of meat up the street, um, grinding his face on the pavement in order to get him to the temple. And if the gods are inside of my parents, then the gods are inside of me. Well, music is one of those things that stirs the gods. In fact, in trance rituals, Yoruban trance rituals, which are the basis for a lot of black American religions. Um, it's a trance religion. So you use drumming, you use music, you use crowd chanting to get the body of a god, originally the god Changa, the god of thunder, to possess the body of a human being. And that human being goes through something that looks like an epileptic fit and then falls to the ground and lays there writhing for three hours under the possession of the gods. So who makes the music? Who writes the lyrics? Who does those incredible performances where you dance like a marionette? The gods. And I realize that since Galileo turned his lands up, Van Leeuwenhoek turned his lands down, and my job was to turn the lands inside oh. and look for the gods and look for the gods inside of us. So that's really where all of this came from. And music is still a mystery. I mean, you know, for all the books that get written about music, like This Is Your Brain on Music, even Einstein, Michael Jackson, and me, probes a lot of aspects of what music is that other people simply haven't probed ever. But for all the books, if you took um, uh, This Is Your Brain on Music plus my book, you still would have only the faintest inkling of what music is, what it does for us, how it does it, because it's effective not only in an individual environment. I mean, just think, uh, in the days of Mozart, could you have had Mozart's music playing to you all day long? No, you had to be very rich, um, have a nice big music hall, um, and you had to be able to afford a bunch of musicians who would stand there and perform the music for you. Um, Actually, no, you could not carry that around. Even if you were the wealthiest man on earth, you couldn't carry it around, except in your memory. Now we listen to Mozart or the Beatles, or uh, nobody listens to the Beatles anymore. Everybody's listening to 70s and 80s music um, these days. So, um, but you get to listen to that on these things, on your earbuds all the time. This is a privilege no one has ever had in the history of the world until the invention of the Walkman in, in the early 1970s. Um, and then there's what music does for us collectively. And what music does for us collectively is magic. But switch your perspective from being the person on stage to being the person in the audience. What happens to you when that concert gets off? Well, first of all, you walk into the auditorium and you're very self-conscious. You want the people behind you and the people on either side of you to think you're cool. So you behave as cool as possible, right? Then the lights go down and the music starts. And slowly but surely, that sense of personal self-consciousness drifts away. And as it drifts away, you go into a state nobody ever describes for you. Um, it's that collective state of being pooled with the other mass, with the mass of those humans. You, the, gods, the gods inside of those artists are speaking to the gods inside of you. And those gods inside of you are coming to the surface. And then conveniently, because we have no words for the gods inside of us, we have no words for this experience, 
when it all is over, once you compose your face again, um, so that other people will think you're cool, which sometimes takes time because a performance or even a film can be so disturbing that you don't want anybody to see your face for 20 minutes. Um, but okay. once you compose your face again, you're back to being normal. You have no vocabulary for what you've just experienced. So you've just been through a magical rite. You have just been through a rite that summons gods in you, and okay. you can't describe it. So you forget about it. You just know you want it because you buy another concert ticket for the next concert. So I had to teach these things to my musicians and I had to learn them myself. And as I said, with Paul Stanley, I had not quite learned this yet. It took years to learn this. Let's talk about another mate, a great rock band, ACDC. You worked with them too? I, and I didn't get to work with them closely. They were handled by, by my friend, David Krebs. Okay. And David Krebs is such a fascinating person himself and so much loves the spotlight. And I hadn't digested this secular shamanism technique yet, uh, that he got in the way. And so there I was being totally absorbed by David. This is a problem with Aerosmith. He also managed Aerosmith. David and I would discuss geofinance, um, what was happening with oil and gold and what it meant for the, for the world. Um, we discussed that for hours. And I didn't really, my, my one meeting with Steven Tyler taught me nothing. It was in David Krebs' office. It wasn't in, Dave, in Steven Tyler's own environment. Steven Tyler is one of the greatest vocalists rock and roll has known oh, yeah. in the last 50 years. And I didn't get to do the soul hunt that was my job, partly because I hadn't totally figured out it was my job yet, and partly because I, I was foolish enough to let David and his fascination distract me. I'm curious, so when you meet with an artist in their own environment, what are you looking for in that, like, real, like the stuff they decorate inside the house kind of shows about what their soul is, or more, just they more let loose in their own environment instead of like a business kind of meeting? Well, you never know. I mean, with John Mellencamp, you drive up to his house. His brother uh, comes and picks you up at the airport. You drive through really, really green, green scenery uh, for two hours. You finally get to the top of the hill, and you're a little confused because there's this road that goes off into the woods, and then there's this clearing in the woods with a driveway big enough for six cars in it, and there's John with his best friend from high school, and they've got a $15 Kmart grill, and they're grilling hamburgers. But you don't see a house anywhere in sight. You see something that looks like a tool shed. That's about it. Wow. So you get out of the car, you're totally confused. You're taken over to the tool shed. They open the door for you. It turns out to be the top of a stairway. So you walk down the stairway, and you end up in the attic of a house. You walk down another stairway, and you're in the second floor of the house you walk down a third stairway and you're in the first floor of the house. It's a house that tumbles down the hill like a waterfall. Um, and you look out the windows. I mean, John put me up in one of his bedrooms and I woke up in the morning and there was the biggest beetle I'd ever seen on, <laughs> on the screen outside the window. And it had these huge horns. It looked really threatened, it looked alien and it looked threatening. And, and uh, John introduced me to his wife, Vicky, who was terrific. She was the daughter of a stunt man. And when she was 17 years old or 16 years old, she'd been on the set of a film. And the guy who was supposed to drive a car that would go uh, do a 360 and land on its wheels again, failed to show up. So she stepped out of the crowd and said, I'll do it. And, and she did it. She was a woman with guts. But it was spending time with John alone, having read every single one of his lyrics. Um, having studied how in the world he got to be hated so much by the press, having studied his history, um, that allowed me to, well, the first question was always, what's the first memory you have of music? When did you come to love music? And there are these certain imprinting points, Stephen. Um, you, you, your brain opens, okay, we, we learned this from ducks and geese. One day, Conrad Lorenz, uh, the founder of a science called ethology, um, Conrad Lorenz had this fairy tale house in the forest in Germany, and it was a Max Planck Research Institute station. It had been his family's home when he was a kid. And it, the house was surrounded, he loved birds, by met nests, duck nests, goose nests, 
And one day he's walking through the nests in order to get to his kitchen door. And he notices that a bunch of little ducklings has tumbled out of its nest and is following him in single file. <laughs> he tries to get into the kitchen. The, the ducklings come into the kitchen with him, um, which is a little strange. Yeah. Um, and those ducklings stick with him for the rest of their lives. When he sits at his desk, these ducklings who are getting bigger and bigger as time goes on are nested around his feet. Um, when guests come over, when the ducklings become adolescents, they become sexually very active. So who do they want to have sex with? Oh um, <laughs> somebody that looks like good old mom, you know, the duck out in the nest that, they, that they've ignored all their lives? No, <laughs> they want to have sex with somebody who looks like Conrad Lorenz. So if you are a guest of Conrad Lorenz, um, you are likely to be wooed by a highly amorous and very big by now duck. <laughs> and, there's, and there's this picture um, at the back of his book on aggression of this man riding a, a well, no, let's put it differently. There's, uh, there's a bunch of geese, because a bunch of geese did this with him too. So there's this, these geese, huge with wingspans, four feet wide, flying in V formation at a height you've never seen before, four feet off the ground. And why are they flying at four feet off the ground? Because the very center of the V is the head of a man riding a bicycle. <laughs> and that man riding a bicycle is Conrad Lorenz. So we're the same, and we have certain imprinting points. We have certain moments when our brain opens up to a certain kind of stimulus, and once it finds it, it wraps itself around that stimulus and keeps it for the rest of your life. It literally changes its brain morphology to accommodate this, this thing you fixated on. Yeah. And in Prince's case, for example, um, I asked that question of Prince. We were backstage at the Shea Theater in Buffalo, New York, which is my hometown, not his hometown. Yeah. You'd think they would send me to Minneapolis. But he was rehearsing for his Dirty Minds tour in the Shea Theater in Buffalo, New York, my hometown. And so I watched him on stage performing with his band, which is very much Prince's world. We oh. went backstage, which is very much Prince's world. We found a room where we could be alone and lock the door. We went into it. That was two in the morning. We emerged at nine o'clock. And wow. the, first, the first story I got, the first passion point story, the first imprinting story was uh, Prince's first musical memory was he was five years old. His mom took him to see his dad rehearsing. His dad was a jazz pianist. And it was a theater very much like the Shea Theater that we were sitting in. And so when you walk into this theater, even though it doesn't have a single observer in it, uh, a paying, no paying customers at all, um, there are 500 seats and they're all lined up focused on this center point on the stage. And there's this spotlight focused on that center point on the stage. And the most important thing is got Prince saw behind his dad the five most beautiful women he had ever seen in his life. And that was it. That was his first imprinting point for music. And the next imprinting point was, there was something I didn't realize about Prince until I'd been working with him for two or three years. And that is the prince is about five, was about five foot two, but his personality was so astonishing that you yeah. never thought of him as being small ever at all. But that's not true when you're in grammar school. When you're in a mixed grammar school and you're black and you're five foot two, you've got to take an awful lot of bullying from the other kids. Yeah. So Prince found a refuge. He had a friend named Andre Simone who became his bassist eventually. Um, and his friend on there, Simone's mother, had an empty room in her basement, a den. Nobody ever used it. So she allowed Prince to use it on the condition that he work on his school, on his school work. And he created an entire alternative society down there. The basic rule was make love, not war, which ironically came out of the hippie movement, which I had accidentally helped found in the 1960s. And that yeah, story you is, and, that <laughs> yeah, how I suddenly started in the 60s. So back to Einstein, Michael Jackson, and me. Um, so Prince's basic rule was follow your instincts. Do anything you want sexually. Live out your sexual fantasies. Thus, you will prevent Ronald Reagan, who was the president at the time, from making war. Um, it was an interesting theory. I don't think it quite worked out. But it did provide Prince a way to create his own tribe. Mm -hmm. um, 
when if you are thrown out by every other tribe that exists, one solution is to create your own tribe. And that's something the prince did, and he did it for the rest of his life. So those are two key imprinting points, two key passion points, two points around which revolve the gods inside for Prince. Um, and then it turned out he had another passion point. So John and I, John Mellencamp and I, were in his living room one day. It was the second year I was working with him, and I insisted if I was going to work with you that I come back and check up on you every, do, every year, do a new soul hunt every year, a new hunt for the gods inside. Because in the same way that your body had changed from a baby to a toddler and a toddler to a child and a child to a teenager and a teenager to adult, your mind, your emotions were changing constantly and maturing. So I had to find how those emotions were manifesting themselves in you each year. Um, and in Prince's case, I got to see that not when I went out to Minneapolis to spend time with him soul hunting, but when he was playing at Nassau Coliseum. Now, Nassau Coliseum is near my home. I, by near, I mean it's a 30 to 60 minute uh, cab ride. Um, so um, I went out to NASA Coliseum to see Prince. But to, again, let's go back to Mellencamp. Yeah. So the second year I was with Mellencamp, he sat me down and he, he made me watch two movies that had shaped his life. One was HUD. Um, they were, these were Lawrence Luckenbill films, I think. Um, one was HUD and the other one was Cool Hand Luke. And it, with HUD, HUD is the story of a young son of a rich rancher who has a big white Cadillac in the days when Cadillacs were the length of three cars today, and who drives the Cadillac into town every day, goes to a bar, bar picks up a bored housewife, who's always gorgeous, of course, and you can guess what he does with them. <laughs> then one day, the authorities come to his dad, and they say, look, there's hoof and mouth in the area, hoof and mouth disease, the only way to stop it is to kill all of the cattle herds um, who might be infected to stop it from going elsewhere. And we're going to have to kill your herd. Well, if you are a rancher, your herd is your 401k. Yeah. Your herd is your entire wealth. So if you're going to kill your herd, your son, HUD, is going to abandon his, he's no longer going to be a rich kid. He's no longer going to have a white Cadillac convertible that he can go into town and pick up other men's wives with. Um, and HUD didn't like that idea. Yeah. So he was plotting to steal the cattle in the middle of the night and sell them elsewhere, which would have spread the hoof and mouth disease all over the place. And then finally, he has a crisis of consciousness and he realizes that he has, a, has an obligation to his fellow human beings and he can't possibly do anything like that. So here's how John summed up the film when it was over. First, you rebel against your father, then you become your father. So, so, I, so I went out to see Prince at Nassau Coliseum and it was a terrific show. The lighting was always terrific. Prince is one of the most dynamic performers you will ever see or was in your life. Um, and he was doing the things you would expect from him. He was just totally entrancing you. And then he got down on the stage, humped it, and went still. And he stayed still for the first 10 seconds, then the next 10 seconds, then the next minute. And we, were, and we began to lose that audience magic. We began to get self-conscious again. We began to panic. We began to think, what if he's having a heart attack? Shouldn't we call 911? Shouldn't we rush up there to help him? And then you heard a voice from 60 feet above you, six stories high, at the very top of the ceiling. And it was the voice of God talking to Prince. So what was going on with Prince? Prince had been the rebel up until then with his make love, not war stance on things. And now he was maturing. And now he was becoming his father. And whose voice really was that voice of God? It was the voice of his father coming alive in him. And that awareness of God, the father, it killed Prince's career. It made Prince the artist formerly known as Prince. It sent Prince off into the wilderness. It caused him to kill a film. Um, he, had done, he had done Purple Rain. And I went out to the set in Minneapolis. As far as I was concerned, the official film publicists, because you have to have them for union purposes, were not doing their job. I stayed on the set for a week. I interviewed everybody involved. Um, I wrote an 80-page uh, booklet on all of the information about the film. And I went back to New York City. 
but I never saw Prince during that week out in Minneapolis. Then I got a call seven or eight months later from Bob Cavallo, Prince's manager and the producer of Prince's films. And Bob said, look, I've been in the uh, editing studio for the last three months and I just cannot make this a film. You've gotta be out here uh, tomorrow morning when we show it to Warner Brothers and see it. So I flew out to LA. Normally I work on a laptop. In those days it was a TRS-100, tiny little laptop that came with 8K of memory. And if you were a nerd like me, who could goose it up to 24K of memory, it would bulge on the back and you'd have to use a lot of gaffer's tape, but you could do it. And so I flew out and normally I would have been on my computer all morning. Um, but instead, when they offered a film, I decided to take it. And I wasn't quite sure why. And I read the description of the film. From a marketing point of view, it was the world's most perfect film. It was a film about a, uh, a single mom. And in those days, single white moms were a brand new phenomena and no one had ever given them any form of cultural expression, no one. Mm -hmm. And the film had Susan Sarandon and Richard Dreyfuss, the perfect cast. I watched the film and it left me with no lump in my throat and no tear in the corner of my eye. You know, when you see a really good film, you don't want anybody to see your face for 15 or 20 minutes. But this film just didn't do it. So I suddenly realized, okay, what meter can you measure a film on? The lump in the throat and the tear in the corner of the eye factor. So I went to uh, Warner's. There was a, normally I'm accustomed to eight to 40 seat screening rooms. This was a 140 seat screening room. And Bob Cavallo, who wanted dearly to get support, um, aid and comfort, wanted me to sit next to him. But I realized that if I was sitting next to Bob, I would be self-conscious through the entire movie and I would never get to see whether that film worked the lump in the throat and the tear in the corner of the eye meter. So sense. I sat way in the back where nobody could possibly see me. And I watched this film and it grabbed you. It grabbed me by the gut. And it just never let go. And somehow the music made the plot yeah. of the film. It was an astonishing film. I had never seen anything like it in my life. So we filed into a conference room with a great big oblong table and, um, and the film publicists, the official film publicists were the first to speak and they looked as if somebody had just strangled a cat. What? And you know, their body language and their facial language was deathly, it was, it was funereal. Um, and so they didn't need to say anything. It wasn't what they said that counted. It was what their bodies and faces said that counted. In other words, this film was dead on arrival, in their opinion. Then a Warner Brothers person spoke and said, we're gonna, uh, we got a plan. We're gonna release this film in six theaters in Arizona and see how it does. Now, Steven, that is the kiss of death in the film world. And I had been, I had been yanked into the film world in 1973 by Frank DeBlanc, the president of Paramount Pictures. So I knew this was a formula way of saying, we are canning your film. Then I got up and spoke. And I said, look, if you kill this film, you're killing a part of entertainment history. It would be like killing the Wizard of Oz. Um, this, we, we went through a great change in the history of music in 1964, when a group, instead of singing songs written on Tin Pen Alley and being totally manipulated by a producer or a manager, wrote their own songs and took command of their own careers. They were called the Beatles. That changed everything. This is the first time that a recording artist has gone into film and basically written, directed, and produced a film himself. It comes directly from his gut. So kill this film and you are killing one of the most vital things to ever enter the history of film. What was there and I sat and well, it changed the whole mood in the room. Um, and Bob Cavallo built on that and he was able to change it from six theaters in Arizona to a hundred theater rollout in a tie-in with this new thing that I had been involved in helping to found in a distant way called MTV. Um, and, and because it was just one of the most powerful films you'll ever see, a $9 million film, which was a low budget back then and is an impossibly low budget now, um, made $90 million, 10 wow. times what it had cost to make. Then Prince went to France. Um, for a year, 
if we wanted to get hold of Prince or wanted to get hold of Steve Farnoli, who was the manager in Bob Cavallo's office, who spent the most time with Prince, we had to call France. Um, and, and I got a call eventually from Bob Cavallo saying, look, we're showing the film that Prince has been working on in France um, at a theater on Sunset Boulevard with 600 seats where all the kids have a dial at their seats so they can dial this way if they don't like a scene and this way if they do oh, like yeah. a scene. And we want you to see the film. So I went out there and the film was wonderful. It was called Under the Cherry Moon. Prince had discovered this new actress named Kristen Scott Thomas, who was a member of the Comédie Française in France, which th that's the French National Theater. Look, they don't even let people who speak English mop the floors at the Comédie Française, oh, wow. much less become a, my a major actress there. But there was something totally remarkable about Kristen Scott Thomas. And she would go on to win an Academy Award nomination for The English Patient, to win another Academy Award nomination for The Horse Whisperer, to do Salmon Fishing in the Amman, which is a terrific movie, to play Winston Churchill's wife in the last hour. Uh, she's just amazing. And Prince w had discovered her. So she was the female star in this film. So I went out to, well, I went out, I watched the film, I looked for Bob in the crowd when it was over. I walked over and said, congratulations, you have a film. And two weeks later, I got another anguished phone call from Bob Cavallo saying, you've got to be out here um, tomorrow night. Um, Prince has changed the ending to his film. And so, yes, so I flew out there. I wasn't supposed to see this film or he would, Bob would have been fired. So I interviewed Kristen Scott Thomas for four hours, which was a remarkable experience. And then the office closed for the night, the building closed for the night, and they left me in a, a storage room with a, uh, a nine inch screen um, and a VCR machine on the bottom shelf. And I sat on the floor because I wasn't supposed to be seeing this film at all. Um, <laughs> and I watched the film and it no longer worked because instead of getting the girl in the end and having a happy ending, Prince gets on, uh, he, he gets on a speedboat and starts driving across the lake and it blows up in the middle of the lake. Uh, now, I knew why he did it. You know, once upon a time, one of the first novels was Small Flanders. And it was by Daniel Defoe, the guy who wrote Robinson Crusoe. And it was about a woman from the underclass, the criminal underclass in Britain. In the days when criminal underclasses were still white. And um, so for uh, 200 pages, you indulge yourself in the tales of sin that this woman was involved in, sex, robbery, who knows what. But because the author, Defoe, had leave you feeling morally clean, morally cleansed at the end of the book, he kills off Maul on the last page, the person you've been identifying with. That's what Prince had to do. Why? Because he was going from rebelling against his father Becoming. to becoming his father. And this film is about a scamp who cons women on the French Riviera, and he and his friend run out of money, and they set their sights on a very wealthy, gorgeous young woman and decide to con her. And instead, Prince ends up falling in love with her and ends up with her in the end. Well, but Prince, that's a scamp. Prince was now the voice of God. He was no longer the voice of the scamps mm -hmm. of the world. And in order to do what Daniel Defoe did, to be morally in line with God at the end of the film, he had to kill that scamp off in the same way that he was killing off the scamp in himself at that so point. Wow. And, and the result was that a film that cost roughly $11 million made $8 million. It was a total waste of time, effort, money, um, because the ending killed the film. But that's the transition Prince was going through. So when you've got those gods inside of you, yeah. they grow, they mature, they change. And what John Mellencamp was explaining to me was so on target, it was ridiculous. So interesting. Well, Howard, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I could talk to you all night. I mean, you're the most interesting person I've ever interviewed. <laughs>
Um, before I let you go, anything coming up you're allowed to talk about? I know you get so many. Yeah, I, there, there is Einstein, Michael Jackson, and me a search for soul in the power pits of rock and roll. When in these days when bookshops are shuttered for the most part, you can yeah. get it at Amazon or you can order online from Barnes and Noble. Um, the film, The Grand Unified Theory of Howard Bloom, um, which uh, was just reviewed in the New York Times, I think last week or the week before. And, and that's about it. I mean, the, you know, I run several space groups um, and uh, one of which I was conned into starting by Buzz Aldrin and the other one that includes the former uh, governor of New York State, David Patterson, Newt Gingrich, because I'm trying to cement things across the aisle with this group and a three-star general and the former head of the uh, science committee for the Congress. And uh, we're all waiting with bated breath. Well, we've just seen it. Elon Musk has just taken the first hop of his Starship. Yeah, which is meant to be a 100-passenger vehicle that's going to totally change the relationship between humankind and space and the relationship between life and space. Life is going to get to go interplanetary, finally. I love it. Such an exciting time we live in now, even though we're all quarantined. <laughs> Stuff like that. Right. Well, Howard, thank you so much, and we'll hopefully talk down the road, all right? Uh, that would be terrific. Thanks, Stephen. Take care, man. All right. Have a good night.